welcome. My name is Lauren Minsky, and I'm a professor here in the history program at New York University Abu Dhabi. And on behalf of the history program and the New York University Abu Dhabi Institute, I'd like to warmly welcome you to this evening's lecture and to introduce our speaker, Professor Hamanchu Prabha Ray, who is undoubtedly one of the most distinguished and prolific archaeologists and historians of the Indian Ocean world. Professor Ray currently serves as head of the newly established National Monuments Authority of the Ministry of Culture, the Government of India, a position that she's held since 2012. And she simultaneously holds an honorary position at the University of Munich. Prior to this, Professor Ray taught as professor at the Center for Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, for over 25 years. She is the recipient of a great many prestigious international fellowships, which have enabled her to conduct research in Germany, the Netherlands, France, England, the US, Canada, and Singapore, among other places. She is also currently the editor of the Routledge India series on archaeology and religion in collaboration with the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies at Oxford. And finally, she is the author of a truly extraordinary number, literally dozens and dozens, of major important books and uh, journals, journal articles. Because it is impossible to, to list all of these, I'm instead going to just highlight some of her most central areas of expertise, which include the early periods of Indian history up to the 6th to 7th century AD, the cultural and economic exchange between India and its neighbors across the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal of the Indian Ocean, the maritime Indian Ocean archaeology of South and Southeast Asia, the influence of colonial attitudes and bias on the historiography of South Asia, and the interpretation of archaeological findings relating to Buddhism throughout the region. Notably as well, in her current position as head of the National Monuments Authority, Professor Ray is launching and running an innovative new research-driven international collaborative to develop a pan-Indian Ocean World Heritage Project uh, known as Project Mausam, named after the monsoon trade winds of the Indian Ocean. It is truly an honor for us to have Professor Ray as our guest in Abu Dhabi and to hear her lecture on the Indian Ocean connections that people created via these monsoon trade winds. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Ray. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's really an honor to be here and to talk to you um, about what has been my own personal research. Um, and I'm really thankful um, to, the, to the NYU AD History Department, as well as the Institute for inviting me for wonderful five days that I have had uh, in Abu Dhabi. It's been a short trip, but I hope it's the beginning of a long collaboration. Uh, I'm thankful to Professor Minsky for her kind words, um, as well as um, for her invitation to me here. Um, what I thought I would do is to draw on my own research, uh, which I've conducted over um, several years and also taught courses uh, in the history department at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, um, and talk to you about the contacts between the Gulf um, and the west coast of India. So that's one cultural route that I would talk about. Um, uh, so really connecting Gujarat and um, uh, the Gulf. And the second route, which I thought I would um, expand upon, um, relates to the much larger position of the Gulf um, in the connections between the Red Sea um, and the west coast of India. So essentially, it is these two routes. Um, and what happened across these routes um, that I would try to map and plot. Um, the reason for doing this is uh, to really uh, think about the past not as a static past, not as something which happened and which we all write about, but to really relate it to the present um, as well as to build for the future. So it's a dynamic past that I think we need to be thinking about. Um, and what makes this dynamic are the communities, the people who traveled. Um, we do know, and I will, I will come to this in a moment, we do know that people traveled across the Indian Ocean starting 5,000 years um, before BCE, before the Common Era, so really 7,000 years ago. Um, there are several communities which, who traveled across the ocean, uh, starting from fishing and sailing communities, communities who harvested pearls and cowries. So it's, it, 
uh, the ocean has not been an empty space. The ocean has had traders, the commodities I have listed, foodstuffs, woods and, uh, wood and textiles were really important commodities that moved across the seas, um, as well as incense, dyes, aromatics, and so on. So as a result of these movements, what we share across the ocean um, is um, both um, um, genetic diversity, um, food habits, borrowings in language, and several other, um, uh, several other issues that we have a shared um, cultural milieu uh, which, uh, in which we all participate. What has made this possible, of course, is the maritime technology, the sailing vessels. Um, but also important has been the way in which uh, people living across the Indian Ocean have uh, conceptualized and controlled space. The challenges are the, is the last one. The challenges really are, what do we do? Fine, there's been this past, there's been this active interaction, there's been this movement, but how do we preserve it? How do we keep it for the future? How do we research it? And I think that's the challenge that all of us face. And this is a challenge which I face in my present job, and this is something which I would um, like to draw your attention to. So when one is looking at um, the Indian Ocean, what brought it together was, of course, the Dhao, the traditional sailing vessel. Um, this is a quote from, um, from a professor, a professor Abdul Sharif, who uh, set up the museum in Zanzibar and worked uh, for several years on the Swahili coast. And as he rightly says, that um, this common tradition of constructing Dhaos, it created a common culture. This culture included foods, clothing, house construction, and so on. So it's really people who provided unity, uh, people who traveled for a variety of reasons, and people who made this shared heritage possible. Now, I don't need to, um, um, to talk to you. I don't need to tell you about, this, uh, about the, world fame, the World Heritage Site Align, which I visited uh, two days ago. And I was, this was a great, um, this was something which I really wanted to do when I landed in Abu Dhabi. It's the, the site itself um, uh, dates back um, to um, uh, 5,000 years ago. But what is, uh, what is very interesting is that it is linked to the history of archaeology uh, in Abu Dhabi. It was also the first World Heritage Site that was uh, inscribed for the country. Um, it is certainly a very important site. It is a Bronze Age site, which continues for several years. Um, and it was one of the earliest sites that was explored and excavated in 1958. That's a long time ago. And today, um, the distribution of sites uh, of the Umannar culture, of which uh, the prime example um, is Al Ain, you can see on the map on the screen, that this culture extends um, uh, over the entire mouth of the Gulf. The distribution of these sites um, is extensive. Archaeologists have found several such sites. Um, and um, uh, some of these uh, are marked on this map. But what is very interesting for me and what is very interesting for my talk is the fact that we share. Uh, the Umanar culture sites have provided um, data and evidence for um, uh, contacts with the Harappans. The, the Harappans, um, this was a civilization, or this was an archaeological civilization, which was discovered by archaeologists in the 1920s. Um, again, over the last 100 years, uh, a large number of sites have been discovered. The green area shows you the extent of uh, the Harappan civilization. Um, and what is also very clear is that it was a very large civilization. So between the Umanar culture of the Gulf and the Harappan culture of the Indian subcontinent, uh, there are several commonalities. There is uh, archaeological data for the presence of um, several goods which were uh, traded. So certainly 
there is very early contact between the Gulf and um, uh, Gujarat, the, west, the western part of the Indian subcontinent. What is also clear is that as early as uh, 3rd millennium BCE, uh, we're looking at uh, three very important uh, trading spheres. Uh, one of them, uh, top of the Red Sea, which is the incense uh, trading sphere, where the red arrow is. The other is at the mouth of the Red Sea, which is the obsidian trading sphere. But the big red circle indicates to you um, the trading sphere between the Gulf and, um, uh, and the Harappan civilization. And that's a very important trading sphere, which starts the beginning of these maritime contacts. Now, having said that, I think we also um, need to be aware that when we look at World Heritage Sites, um, a lot of these you can see on the map, all the yellow dots on that map are World Heritage Sites. They're all coastal. But when we try to connect them, we don't connect them across the ocean. Instead, we connect them within uh, the particular country. And I think that's where the challenge lies, and that's where we need to start thinking across the ocean rather than thinking of our own individual countries um, and um, the World Heritage Sites that exist there. There's been other kind of new work which makes, I think, uh, which makes this possible, uh, which also um, talks about uh, genetic diversity. And this work uh, has been done by anthropologists. It is based on a mapping of um, lineages of populations. And a lot of this work suggests um, that movements across the ocean were nothing new, um, that there are diverse populations uh, across the Indian Ocean. Uh, they share several, um, uh, several commonalities. And clearly, we need to now reorient our thinking um, from land-based histories to look at what moved across the ocean and um, how it moved. And uh, what moved included foodstuffs. Uh, and again, there has been archaeological work where archaeologists have uh, studied or identified botanical remains. Um, and have traced the movements of ordinary foods, which we all relate to, foods like millets, um, sorghum, sandalwood. But um, uh, sandalwood is not a, uh, is not a food, it's an uh, incense. Uh, uh, black pepper, the ginger plant, all these foods, uh, or all these plants, plant remains, um, have moved across the ocean. What is also clear is that um, we have very early boat finds, which, um, uh, which again uh, come from uh, this part of the world, uh, from the Gulf, from Kuwait, from Ras al Jinj. Um, these are sites which date 5,500 to 5,000 BCE. Um, and um, in some cases, uh, parts of boats have been found, but in other cases, a bitumen has been found, bitumen, bitumen was used for coating the boats. Uh, and so all of this provides us uh, information and data to, um, to sort of really re-examine uh, the history of the Indian Ocean. Um, one of the important wrecks that was found um, was uh, a shipwreck. This is somewhat later than the ones I've been talking about as of now. Uh, this was found in Indonesia, off the coast of Sumatra. It was found in 1998 by fishermen, which is not unusual, because it's the fishermen who usually um, you know, dive into the ocean and um, get interesting information about boats and uh, cargo. But what is very interesting is that um, the cargo of this vessel was Chinese ceramics. Chinese pottery, Chinese ceramics were very popular, uh, were traded across the Indian Ocean. And 
these were traded starting from the 9th century and continued well into the 14th, 15th centuries. But many of these Chinese ceramics were made for different, uh, 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 different consumers. And one of the points that I have on the slide is that some of the pieces of this Chinese ware uh, were inscribed in Arabic. So clearly, they were meant for consumers in this part of the world. So in addition to the ceramics, there were several other things, including gold vessels. Um, there were silver ingots, and um, certainly um, uh, many other objects which were found in, on this shipwreck. Uh, this ship um, traveled. Um, this is the probable route of the ship that it took. It started from the East African coast. Um, it, um, the blue shows um, Oman, and it traveled along the coast all the way to Indonesia. Um, the red arrow shows uh, where it was found off the coast of Sumatra. And um, a project was undertaken to actually reconstruct uh, this, um, uh, this ship. It was called, uh, it was a replica of this Belitung uh, shipwreck. It was known as the Jewel of Muscat. And it, is, it continues to be displayed um, in Singapore uh, based on the kind of information that was made available as a result of this shipwreck. So the point I've made so far is that um, there is no shortage of data. There is no shortage of information, which allows us to challenge traditional ways of looking at the past. And we should re-examine this data and start thinking in other ways of reconnecting to this past. So one way in which historians have looked at the past and have looked at these uh, contacts is that these were trading contacts. And there's been a lot of literature on this. Uh, it's certainly, there's quite a lot um, more than I can talk about here today. But these contacts continued starting from the fourth, third millennium BCE, which I started about, about these various spheres of trade, um, until the entry of the Europeans in the 15th century and even beyond that. So certainly, trade and trading activity has been a staple um, of historians and archaeologists. Um, and there is, uh, there is an increasing body of um, literature which talks about uh, this, um, these, these contacts. Um, I'm not going to cover all of this. I just want to draw your attention to some of the interesting facets of these connections. Um, I thought I could start with uh, this text, the Periplus Maris Eretria. It is written in Greek. It's dated to the first century. And in a way, it's an interesting text because it provides information of travel from the Red Sea to the east coast of India. It doesn't go all the way to Southeast Asia, but I'll show you a map in a moment. Um, and it talks about two things which are very interesting for my purposes. One, it talks about trade goods. So it says, OK, you know, if you go to the, the South Arabian coast, you should take this. This is what you should sell. This is what is in demand. So it gives, uh, it gives an account of um, what people um, uh, what, would be, what would sell easily in different parts of the Indian Ocean, literal. But I think it's quite an extraordinary text but because it provides um, graphic accounts of the coast. And it also talks about various uh, regions which are to be avoided. And that's where it makes life far more interesting and challenging. Now, uh, if you look at this map, what you will notice is um, the dots start from the Red Sea, from the um, left hand, uh, uh, the top uh, left hand. And they go all the way to the west coast of India. There are many dots on, many blue dots on the west coast of India. There are hardly any on the east coast of India. But I think the surprise element is that area, the Gulf. You don't see many dots there. Uh, now, one would like to ask why. We've seen that there was this very early boat finds. We've seen that archaeology has provided us evidence uh, for a very active um, uh, sailing 
um, and trading in the Gulf. So why don't we find these mentioned in the Periplos? Instead, the Periplos says that um, it talks about the coast of Arabia, and it says it's very risky, there is poor anchorage, and it cannot be approached because of cliffs, um, and you know, talks about all these problems. So did these problems actually prevent people from coming to this part of the coast? Certainly not. Uh, again, I think archaeology comes to our aid, and archaeology provides us information on a variety of settlements in the Gulf. Um, I've put in that question mark, did Alexander actually come to Arabia? We don't really know. But what we do know is that there are Hellenistic settlements, there are burials, there is writing in Greek on um, uh, pottery. Um, there are several sites, Kalat al-Bahrain, Failaka, uh, which have provided us with a lot of information about the variety of uh, archaeological sites uh, in the Gulf. The arrows show you where the major archaeological sites are. Um, and as you can see, starting from Failaka, coming up to Edur in UAE, there are several major Hellenistic settlements in this part of the, um, of the Indian Ocean. So where were they in contact with? We've seen the map of the Periplos. We've seen the problems mm -hmm. that are referred to. I do think uh, there is a lot of information that many of these sites, which I've just shown you, were in contact with Gujarat. And through Gujarat, through the Indus, uh, up to the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent, um, I, I'll, I'll point out the evidence for my statement. Um, the evidence comes in the form of um, uh, Roman glass, which has been found at many of these sites in burials. It comes in the form of um, the coins that have been found and also um, a lot of uh, uh, graffiti, particularly Greek graffiti, which, ha which has been found in archaeological contexts. And the site that's particularly important for this purposes is Edur or Omana, uh, as the Periplus refers to it. And at the bottom, uh, the second point um, on the screen, uh, talks about the variety of coins, which gives you an idea of the kind of contacts that the Gulf had uh, with the Mediterranean, with Mesopotamia, South Arabia, but also India. And the last point, there are at least five Indian coins which are dated 1st century BCE to 1st century CE. Now let us look at the other end. So where, were, where are these coins coming from? and which is the area that they were in, that the Gulf was in contact with. I would like to argue that Gujarat played a very important role um, in this early uh, seafaring activity. Uh, again, I talk about two, the, the, the blue arrows. Uh, they show you two of the areas which are referred to in the Periplus, the Gulf of, the Gulf of Kutch, the run of Kutch, uh, which also had Harappan presence, which we talked about earlier, uh, but was also very active in this period um, and is referred to in the Periplus. The other is the site of Barigaza, or which is the Greek name, or Broch, Bharuch, uh, at the mouth of the river Narmada, uh, on the west coast of India, which is the second blue arrow on the screen, uh, which is again a very fertile area, and uh, which again uh, has provided evidence for um, uh, very early contacts with the Gulf. What is also interesting, I thought I would put these slides just to give you an idea of the kind of information that the Periplus talks about and how it describes these places. So for example, it says in Kutch, and you can see it on the slide, that the land cannot be seen from the sea. It is hidden from view. And there are several shoals, so which makes um, uh, sailing very difficult. And also that um, ships um, run the risk of going aground. But it also talks about uh, the uh, king, 
um, send, sending out uh, fishermen uh, to guide the vessels in. And this gives you an idea of the importance of these contacts, which meant that the various rulers um, in these kingdoms sent out vessels, uh, traditional vessels. Um, the, the slide show, shows you um, a traditional shipbuilding center in uh, Gujarat, in Mandavi, where um, uh, these traditional vessels continue to be made. And even today, we do have very active um, uh, maybe I could use the word Dao, the Dao trade between, um, the, uh, between Gujarat and the Gulf. So if you're looking at what was the political situation and what are these coins that were found, who was ruling in Gujarat, what are the languages that are being used, um, one of the dynasties which becomes very important is that of the Western Kshatrapas. Uh, who ruled in this area around the beginning of the common era. But what is interesting about their rule as, is that they issued coins which had inscriptions in Greek on one side and on the, in the local language on the other side. And it is many of these, uh, many of these coins that occur uh, in um, the region um, of uh, the Gulf. In addition to the coins, um, there is um, archaeologists look at pottery. They like to identify pottery. They um, uh, use pottery um, to talk about um, what uh, was carried, how this was carried, um, and the kind of contacts that may have been possible. Um, and one of the types of pottery uh, which archaeologists are increasingly talking about are these torpedo jars, uh, which again have been found uh, both in the Gulf and in uh, parts of the uh, uh, of uh, Western India. You can see the green arrows um, on the. You can sorry, they're not green. They're blue arrows on the screen, and um, which point out the. Uh, places where uh, these uh, jars have been found. Let us move on. Let us look at the 6th century. And look, let us look at another traveler. This time, the traveler is Cosmos Indicoplistus. Uh, he possibly lived in Egypt uh, in the 6th century. He started off as being a merchant, but then he became uh, a monk, a Christian uh, monastic. And he traveled to India, but he says that he traveled to three gulfs, the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Arabian Gulf. He talks about Nestorian Christians. And um, his text is known as the Christian topography, uh, which lists um, the shape of the world. And that's the map, which was drawn based on data that he provided. And as you can notice, it has very little to do with the way we uh, identify the world, and it was really his conception of the way the world was, um, and is very different from our conception of the way in which we see the world and we see the Indian Ocean. But what is, uh, what is uh, significant and what is uh, particularly clear is that um, there were several uh, Christian settlements uh, dated from the 5th to the 9th centuries. And um, uh, Cosmos refers to many of them, um, and he talks about connections that these settlements maintained with the west coast of India. So he's talking about further south, not just Gujarat, but further south, Kerala, um, other places uh, on the west coast of India. And uh, he does mention that many of these contacts were trade contacts. Um, in addition to the fact that they were also religious contacts. So let us move on and look at what was happening in Gujarat, say, between the 8th century and the 14th century. So certainly there were Christian communities moving into the west coast of India, settled also in the Gulf, but there were other communities. There were also the Zoroastrian settlements. And again, this has, uh, we've got information on this from archaeology. Uh, 
Uh, there's a 10th century um, uh, uh, Tower of Silence that was excavated um, on the Gujarat coast. So in addition, so the point I'm making is that the, the religious affiliation of the people who lived, who settled, who traded, who moved was very diverse. And this is very clear from the archaeological data that we get. But what is also very clear at this time are the very beautiful monuments which are built and the very extensive trade networks that are in existence. So these sites that I think are particularly important for my purposes are the three sites. Um, the top you see Patan, uh, which I will show you in a moment, uh, which was a settlement, a fortified settlement from the eighth century. It continues today to be a very important center. And you can see those red lines which connect the inland area to the coast. Uh, the second site, which is, uh, which is up there, which I will talk about is Bhadreshwar on the Gulf of Kutch, which again is a very fascinating and a very interesting site. And the third site is um, Somnath. Now, why are they interesting and what is the kind of evidence that we get? Um, this I thought, this is the latest inscription um, uh, for world heritage status in India, so I thought I should put it in and I should show you this is a step well. It's seven stories, so you, it's a well that goes down seven stories into the earth, and um, this uh, was meant as a, not just to collect water, but was uh, in effect a social uh, structure, I would argue. And what makes it really exquisite is this sculpting and the fact that uh, the whole well, it's not just that there are steps and you go down and you get to collect water, as you do in, um, in most wells, but that um, it was a world of its own, very beautifully sculpted, and it provides a microcosm of uh, a medieval um, Gujarat. Another kind of database that we have are these um, literary writings, which um, date from the 13th, 14th century. And these writings are often writings, the hero of which um, are merchants, and particularly Jain merchants. One of them is um, uh, Jagadu Charit. This is a very interesting story. Unfortunately, I do not want to spend too much time telling you the story, but the merchant trades with the Gulf. He's based in Bhadreshwar, which I pointed out in the Gulf of Kutch a little while ago. He trades in horses, he trades with the Gulf, and um, the, uh, the uh, epic poem talks about his ships uh, laden with, merchant, uh, with merchandise uh, which sail to Hormuz. Um, that's one part of the story, the fact that you know, he was a very prosperous merchant and he was moving back and forth between the Gulf and um, Kutch. The other part of the story is that he prays to the Lord of the Ocean um, for uh, sons, the fact being that he feels what will happen to his wealth after he dies, so he, uh, he needs progeny. And that's the other, uh, the other sort of twist in the tale of this, um, uh, of this epic poem. And the final part, of course, is that he's, uh, he's a, he is known for his charity. He builds, he saves the town of Bhadreshwar from attack. Uh, he also uh, distributes grain um, from, um, from his own resources to save the people from famine. But what we have in this, air, in this time in Kutch, in Gujarat, are these fortified um, towns. This fortification exists to this day. It is uh, Dabhol, which is uh, a town in Gujarat. Um, um, it's very unusual for 14th century fortifications um, to continue. So it's, it's very nice and very good that Dabhol does have, does provide evidence uh, of um, this fortified settlement. And that is where I think it's important that we look at our monuments and preserve them. But we have another kind of data, which are inscriptions. And these inscriptions talk about um, the interaction between uh, the Nakhuda, between the shipper, 
and where he lands, the local community. And particularly important is a 13th century inscription. You remember I had pointed out Somnath on the coast of Gujarat a little while ago. Um, this inscription is a bilingual inscription. It is in two languages. It is in Arabic and it is also in Sanskrit. Um, and it was set up um, uh, by uh, the Nakhuda, the shipper, uh, who had close contacts with the community around Somnath. It talks about an endowment that was made for a mosque. The mosque is called Dharmasthan in Sanskrit. You know, in Arabic, of course, it's referred to uh, by the Arabic term, but um, this, this difference between, and that provides us very interesting and fascinating insights into the way in which um, the Arabic worldview and the Sanskrit worldview come together in this inscription to record that this Nakhuda, who had come from uh, Hormuz, uh, uh, Hormuja Desha, um, and that with the, uh, with the support of the local community, he had set up a mosque there. Uh, there are two versions, like I mentioned. There's the Sanskrit version, and there is the Arabic word, version. They're not the same. There are differences. There would be differences because you know, languages uh, reflect the thought process very differently. Um, so the, um, the Sanskrit version talks about how land was acquired from local residents um, and how this endowment was set up, whereas um, the uh, Arabic version talks more about the mosque. It refers to the mosque. And it talks about the donor's father and um, lists the imam and the muazzin and other beneficiaries. So there are differences between the two versions. They are not the same. And I think it's important to look at these partnerships and these relationships um, when, we, um, uh, when we talk about the history of the um, Indian Ocean. And particularly, the relationships that are important for my purposes is the relationship that the ship owner the Nakuda or the captain of the ship, he maintained with um, uh, coastal communities or the communities where he sailed, where he settled, where he traded. Um, and inscriptions as well as literature provide us very um, interesting insights into this. Uh, certainly, uh, Gujarat had several uh, medieval settlements several uh, areas which had sizable Muslim merchant populations. Um, and this is particularly evident from the Geniza papers, which I will come to in a moment. Um, but the sites that are important for my purposes is Bhadreshwar, which I've already shown you, Patan, which I've talked about, and Somnath. And the evidence that we have, particularly for the 12th, 13th century, are tombstones. Uh, which are dated to this period and which bear inscriptions. Um, this is um, the temple of Somnath as it exists today in Gujarat. And I've already pointed this out to you um, on an earlier map where Somnath is. So then, up till now, we have talked about one of the major cultural routes, Gujarat and the Gulf. I'd like to move on and talk about my second cultural route, which is somewhat wider uh, than just Gujarat and the Gulf. And this will take me to the Red Sea, and this will take me to Aden and to the west coast of India. Again, archaeologically, this is an area where we have, in recent years, and I must say that over the last 20 years, archaeological excavations and archaeological data has added a great deal to, our, to the information that we have, um, has really filled up um, information about many of the sites that I'm talking to you uh, tonight. And um, you can see the points, the black points on this map, and um, the several um, excavations that have been carried out. But I think the most surprising and the most fascinating is the island of Sakotra. Um, today, Sakotra is part of the Republic of Yemen. Um, it is at the mouth of the Red Sea. Um, I will sh it was marked on the previous map, but I'll show you another map in a moment. And uh, Sakotra is today a World Heritage Site, but not known for its archaeology, but for its natural heritage. 
and the fact that it has some of the rare and um, unique plants that we know of. But for my purposes and for our purposes, the island of Socotra is very important because of um, the kind of inscriptions that we get. Particularly from um, uh, on the top, you see the Huck Cave, uh, which was explored. It is a cave at the northern face, um, on the northern side of the island. It was explored in 2001. And very surprisingly, uh, more than 200 graffiti inscriptions were found um, almost 2,000 meters um, into the cave. So the cave is very deep. And all along, it is, has inscriptions. Um, that's the cave. You can see the red line, which starts at the mouth. There are about at least um, 17 or 18 sites marked there. Um, um, uh, and um, these sites are all sites which have inscriptions, which talk about the people who um, visited the island of Socotra. And from these inscriptions, it's very clear um, that this was a diverse body of merchants who traveled to Socotra, made Socotra um, their, um, their home, but also used these caves for purposes other than trading. I would argue um, that these inscriptions have been put up um, as either uh, thanksgiving or in a variety of ways. There are several scripts which we know of. Uh, Brahmi is a script that was used in India. Um, it, is, it was used as early as the 4th century BCE, um, and we have several inscriptions in Brahmi from several parts. But there's also uh, uh, Arabian, uh, Axumite Arabian graffiti, and quite distinctive Aramaic writings, um, Greek writings, um, as well as um, writings in the Palmyran script, and, uh, the, and the scripts of South Arabia. So the point then is that what you get is a huge variety. And what you get is the way in which um, the, the people who traveled these routes, um, the way in which they reflected their concerns and made uh, these um, inscriptions. So let me move on to my uh, final route, which is the Aden Mangalore route. Sakotra, as you know, is um, at the mouth uh, of the Red Sea and, um, um, and is just across from Aden. Um, for this route, we get another kind of uh, resource, which is the Geniza papers, which were found in Cairo. These are texts which are written in the Judeo-Arabic uh, script. Uh, they were found in a synagogue um, in the 11th, 12th century. But what is quite fascinating is that of these, there are almost about 460 documents which are referred to as India letters. These are letters which were written, um, uh, for, um, were written by people who traveled to India, who traveled from Aden uh, to the west coast of India. And these letters are not, are not historical records, but they are um, ordinary letters which people write and again, provide all kinds of information uh, for this period. Many of these letters are still being translated, are still being, uh, um, it's not easy to read them because the script is very different, the language um, has changed. Um, and so while, um, uh, and there's a third problem that when they were found in the synagogue, the letters were all scattered. So now you find them in different museums and libraries and it's not possible to have them in one place. So the challenges are several, but the letters provide most fascinating information, as I will, um, I will show you in a moment. This is the restored uh, Ben Ezra synagogue in Old Cairo, and this is where the uh, letter, the Geniza papers were found. They refer to travel between those two arrows that show you Aden and Mangalore, which is on the Karnataka coast. Uh, it talks about several families of merchants who traveled along this coast, um, and it talks about uh, several centers, and at least 20 centers on the west coast of India where uh, trade was carried on. But what is also interesting is that in Aden itself, 
um, there is a lot of information that tells us that customs duties were, levy were levied um, uh, at several of these coastal centers and that the officials made sure that the traders pay, uh, paid the customs duties um, and did not escape, did not sail away uh, without paying uh, the government what was due to it. Uh, and so it talks about how the officials, they removed the masts and the sails and that they ensured that the ship remained in anchor till the duty was paid. Um, another kind of information that we get is about partnerships in this India trade. And again, these partnerships are quite extraordinary. Uh, they are between, uh, certainly between Jewish merchants and their co-religionists, but they're also between Jewish and non-Jewish trading groups. Um, there's al also information on how one of these merchants, Abraham bin Yiju, uh, he spent 17 years uh, in Karnataka. He was originally from Aden, traveled to India, and he set up a brass factory. Uh, he married a slave girl, and uh, he applied for manumission for this slave girl. But the other kind of information which I've already mentioned to you is between merchants and uh, shippers, and certainly the very interesting part played by shippers um, and, the, um, and the donations made by them and for them. This um, Ibrahim bin Yiju, if some of you have read uh, Amitabh Ghosh's novel in an antique land where he very eloquently describes how uh, uh, Ibrahim bin Yiju, he uh, traveled to Mangalore, he traveled to the Karnatak coast, and that he was a man of many talents, he was a merchant, um, but he was also a manufacturer, he was familiar with medical cures, and none of this is very surprising because um, in most cases, the merchants were not just traders, they were really a multifaceted, tal talented people who, um, who helped solve many of the other problems rather than just simply trading um, in goods. And what, what the Geniza papers also provide us are very interesting lists where customers uh, place orders for uh, this brass factory and say to the merchant what he should make and how he should make it and how he should send it back. So it's not just trade that's going on, but also manufacturing. Also the fact that a lot of transfer of knowledge is taking place between Aden and Mangalore. Uh, but again, this is not, um, this is not sort of, um, uh, not a safe business as I would put it, because there are several uh, cases where uh, ships are wrecked. Um, there are instances of goods being lost during attacks. There are pirates which are referred to. And, um, uh, um, when, uh, when at risk, a lot of the goods were jettisoned and lost. So um, uh, there is a legal system had to come up. A legal system was put in place as to what is to be done when goods are lost or what is to be done when the merchant loses the money that he has invested in this trade. Uh, so this is uh, on the, on the left-hand side. You see what a Geniza document looks like. Um, every bit... Uh, is used, um, it's not easy to read the script, uh, but it does provide very interesting information also about uh, many of the families um, who uh, traded between Aden and uh, the Mangalore coast. And here you have a reference to somebody who was a Nakuda, who was a ship captain, and how he placed an order uh, with uh, Ibrahim Ben Yiju for bronze vessels. Now let me conclude um, this presentation. And uh, let me conclude by uh, um, talking about how do we then move forward? Um, and how do, we, uh, how do we take all these, the, the two routes that I have talked about? Uh, how do we develop this further? I have shown you evidence. I have provided information on some of the archeology span that is being done. But there's still a lot that needs to be done. It is not, we still have very fragmentary scattered data, uh, but there's still many things which we do not know. And there are many gaps which are to be filled. 
So my first, uh, my first sort of wish uh, uh, my, on my wish list, the first point is that we need to do collaborative research. Um, and we need to uh, share um, knowledge if we are to build up um, networks across the Indian Ocean which connected uh, and which provided this shared cultural heritage that I've been talking about. The second point that I would like to make is that uh, we now need to look at cultural roots rather than looking at national histories. So while many of our sites, which I have shown you, are World Heritage, World Heritage sites, are important sites, uh, but we also need to see how they connected across the ocean rather than just simply looking at them. And my third point, which comes from the work I do and um, also deals with the kind of problems that we face in India, is the whole question of preserving monuments um, and trying to see that certainly cities should develop, certainly there should be building activity, but this build, building activity and cities should not be at the cost of monuments and should not be at the cost of heritage. So with those words, I thank you for your patience and um, for listening to me, and I'd be very glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, what do you mean by the word Arabia? Do you mean only the Gulf or all the Arabic peninsula or all the Arabic countries? First then, has Alexander the Great, uh, for example, come to Arabic countries or to the peninsula or to the Gulf as you mentioned? I don't know what do you mean by, then there are three cities uh, built by uh, Silocus Nicotor, who is one of the leaders of Alexander al Magdoni or the Great. Uh, when on his ma uh, wife's name, uh, Apamia, who is his, uh, she's from Persia, and there's Antichos on his father's name, Antakya, and there's Laodikia on his mother's name, Latakia. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, when um, Alexander crossed into India, uh, he crossed the Indus, and then he um, uh, sent Nearchus, his, uh, his admiral, to sail down the Indus and to sail across the Makran coast into the Gulf and into um, what I would call the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, now the question is, um, what do we know about, this is referred to in Aryan um, and it survives in fragments in Greek history which dates to a later period. Now, uh, what kind of evidence do we have to prove all these cities? We have several cities, you've mentioned some of them and you're right. Uh, there are several cities which are also mentioned in India that he made and on the Indus. The problem has been that uh, many, much of this information comes from a later period. Um, and archeologists have been trying to find these cities uh, with very little success because the the information is not contemporary information, but is information which dates to a later period. So I hope that answers your question, that certainly um, Nearchus uh, is said to have uh, sailed down the Bakran coast and entered the Gulf. But whether Alexander made it, whether he conquered uh, uh, the peninsula is the issue. He certainly traversed it. Um, and his uh, successors uh, are known to have uh, set up settlements, and I did talk about the Hellenistic settlements in the region. A coin of Rudrana that you mentioned, that one side, there was Greek yeah. inscription. The other side, you said local Indian. What was the local Indian language? The language is Prakrit. It's Nahapana's coins. And um, a lot of these coins, in, these are dated in the early centuries of the Common Era. Many of these coins in the Deccan are bilingual. Usually the inscription um, is in Prakrit, um, uh, which is a language that is used in the coins at this time. Uh, but it's surprising that Nahapana's coins, which are circulating in Gujarat, use Greek. And it is very bad Greek. It is not, uh, it is not refined Greek. But it just, you know, they just, it's interesting that they are using the Greek uh, and using the same, le the legend just says, you know, king of kings, uh, Nahapana, his majesty, so on and so forth. So it's just, it's just the name. Uh, but um, 
the reason why it's interesting is because uh, the Periplus does talk about Greek being used in this area for a very long time. And it says Alexander's successors were here and they uh, and these coins uh, circulated. So that's, that was the reason why I think that Nahapana becomes important for our purposes. Uh, how much do we know about these trading routes being um, shared with traders? Were there monopolies established over routes and, and uh, regions of trade? Um, thanks, that's an interesting question. We, um, you know, when you look at, um, when you look at uh, contemporary inscriptions of the rulers, um, the rulers talk about how they control the seas. But in effect, what does this mean? It's fine to say somebody controls something, but did they actually control it? Was there monopoly? And the only reference we do get to this is, again, the Periplus, which says that uh, when uh, vessels were coming in into Gujarat, the king sent out ships. Uh, it's not very clear from the evidence what this means. Does it mean that um, these ships actually um, uh, monopolized the route and sent the incoming vessels to another port? Uh, or does it mean, uh, because uh, many of these rivers were very hard to navigate, so they did require help from the local, uh, uh, from the local communities. Um, in effect then, um, I would argue that there's very little evidence for control or monopoly. A lot of these routes were shared, um, and a lot of uh, uh, the data that I've presented does talk about partnerships which cut across either religious groups or cultural groups, and that um, it, was, um, it was very hard uh, to actually, um, even if anybody wanted to, to implement these uh, monopolies. Uh, and this doesn't happen. I mean, this doesn't happen till a much, much later period. In two of your slides, you mentioned, um, you showed, and you also talked about Hormuz. Yeah. Uh, and I think the date um, associated with what you talked about was the 13th century, mm -hmm. which suggests that Hormuz at that time was still on the mainland before it had transferred to the island uh, of Hormuz, which then became a, a, a magnificent a cosmopolitan capital uh, of the world in the, in the 15th century. And then so I was wondering, um, one, one, one episode in this story that you've given us yeah, is yeah. perhaps is, is more about Hormuz and the Portuguese involvement and, and, and the mixed communities that existed on Hormuz, tr doing trade between Basra and then China. And, um, there were even you know, Jewish communities on Hormuz yeah. in, the, in its heyday. So, uh, I think I'm just uh, asking for clarification on your views about Hormuz. Um, uh, Thanks. I'm not sure I can answer that question because I think the uh, that's something that the local ar archaeologists would be uh, more would be better equipped to answer that. Uh, but we do know that um, a lot of the names um, shifted and have uh, you know moved. You, one uses the same name, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the same place as it is today. And uh, Parton, I know, is a good example because where you have Parton today, it has shifted. The earlier uh, six, uh, the seven to thirteenth century Parton was, uh, you know, a little farther away. Then there was uh, attacks, and then that was abandoned, and then it shifted. So certainly, that's a, um, that's a phenomenon which does happen, where um, settlements have shifted, but the name continues, and it's not as if um, uh, you know uh, these things were static. Um, and the point I made was um, regard, and a, and a lot of the time we do have problems of identification as to where exactly these ancient settlements were. Um, and the point I was making was how Hormuz um, figures very prominently um, in inscriptions which come from the west coast of India, but also in epic poems which talk about this, uh, this continuing trade uh, between the Gulf um, uh, and the Gulf of Kutch um, uh, in Gujarat. Um, and certainly a point is well taken that uh, you know, um, there were shifts. And um, um, you also brought in the question of Chinese trade, and thanks for that. I did mention it very briefly, which I didn't manage to develop, um, because I thought if I um, extend my cultural roots, uh, we'd all be here all evening, and then so I should sort of <laughs> really <laughs> 
and you know, keep it within limits. And that was one reason why I didn't bring in the Chinese trade. But we do get Chinese ceramics um, starting from the 7th century onward. 